I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles, whether it's an electronic copy or a, a print copy, that you open them up to the book of Romans. Right? You can see, right, if you open up this, we're right at the beginning of the book of Romans, you can kind of see in terms of where we are, uh, as we're a good way through the scriptures in terms of that, uh, even though uh, we're in a, uh, a book that's going to cause us to go carefully and, and uh, it's a weighty material. So I want to invite you to get ready. We're going to be in chapter 2 today, uh, and, and I've got a big job ahead of me today. I'm going to do chapter 2, verse 1, all the way through chapter 3, verse 8. And some of you are saying, that ain't happening. But by God's grace, by God's grace it's going to happen, and I guarantee you I will get you out of here before 2, I promise. So those are the kind of things that, uh, just to set your expectations today. Uh, but um, I'm looking forward to walking through this. I was telling my, my fellow pastors uh, uh, that this has been a very difficult uh, passage for me to work through and to figure out exactly what it is that I want, uh, what, what I think that God wants to say to us through this passage. And so it's been a, an encouragement for me. It's been a hard study. Uh, and I hope indeed that I can uh, open up this passage to you and also take you to some very important truths uh, that, it, that we need to see through it. Now, I just want to remind you that we are, as we're walking our way through, I don't know if you've noticed, if you, if you, can, you can turn around now and look on that back wall. First, I want you to look at Matt Jobson and, and Jake Hol uh, Holloway who are talking to each other right there. But other than that, look at, look at the, the verses that are on the back. Those are the verses that we are memorizing uh, as we walk through the book of Romans. And so uh, the first verses that we have for memorization are really the verses that are the theme verses of the whole of the book of Romans. So would you read this one with me? You can stay seated, but let's read this together. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Romans 1, 16 and 17. So that's a key verse. And matter of fact, as we enter in our passage, we're in a passage that uh, Paul is making it clear why that's such good news. Uh, because we have such a deep need. We need God's power to be unleashed to deliver us from the terrible situation that we're in. So uh, that's where we're going to be today. So as we move through this, I want you to take, I know you're in chapter 2, you might be able to look right over to chapter 3 for a moment here, and look down to chapter 3 and verse 10, key verse here. Paul is on a march, and he begins with a quotation here in verse 10, there is no one righteous, not even one. Okay? So one of the things that you can look at this opening section, it really is going to go, th go through to chapter 3, verse 20, before Paul starts to turn the lights on. And if you're reading the letter itself, chapter 1, 18, down through chapter 3, verse uh, 20 seems like not very good news. Doesn't seem like very good news at all. Matter of fact, it's, it seems kind of depressing as you walk your way through it. I remember um, um, Rana coming up to me after studying chapter 1, 18 through the end of the chapter. Uh, Paul, uh, she said to me, quote, this is depressing, unquote. Right, was her assessment uh, of that, that passage as she looked at it. And so Paul is busy, if you want to look at it here, is he's taking every individual. He's taking every individual, no matter who they are, no matter what ethnic background they have, no matter how powerful they are, how educated they are, uh, what kind of uh, uh, family they come from, and he is attempting to show them that they have no grounds to appeal for God's mercy before his bar of justice. They have no grounds. And so he's going to say that I'm going to, uh, I want, if I have done my case and you have read me carefully, is I want you to get to end of chapter 3 and I want verse 20 and say that I don't have one plea to make before the judge of the universe. I don't have any plea to make. All I can ask for is mercy. 
right? So that's what he's trying to do. So that's where we are. And in chapter 3, verse 21 and 26 is where we get the answer. We get the lights turned on, right? So he's busy closing all the exits we think that we can get out from underneath God's justice. He's busy closing all those exits. We think, well, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can do No, he's closed, 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 closed. And then all of a sudden you're there and you're in the darkness and you're saying, well, this is hopeless. How do I get out of that? And that's where Jesus steps in. That's where Jesus steps in. So that's what we're doing here. Now, you'll notice here when we come to this passage, um, I, I, I pulled this out the other day. Uh, Grace Kelly, first off, I wanted to say she's a beautiful woman, number one. I looked at that picture. Uh, some of you know her. She's a movie star from mid-19th uh, century. But one of the things that uh, uh, she's famous for saying, Hollywood amuses me holier than thou for public and unholier than the devil in reality. And... Uh, Apart from what we want to say about Hollywood, we don't really want to talk about Hollywood here at the moment, uh, but the whole idea of hypocrisy is something that we're all sensitive to. We have all kinds of little phrases about people who judge other people and don't do the very things that they judge other people for, right? We've got holier-than-thou statements, right, self-righteous, all those types of things, where Paul is going to be dealing in chapter 2 with his fellow contemporary Jews, And if anybody in the ancient world thought that they didn't belong in the category of people in chapter 1, those people who knew about God, who rejected God, who replaced God, and who began to rejoice in evil, the Jews themselves would have said, well, that's not me. That's not me. We're good with God, right? Now, one of the things here when it comes to God, and here in our culture in America, we want to be affirmed for who we are. I want God who affirms me. I want a God who says I'm okay. And if he is God, the one who is worth my time and worship, he will affirm however I express myself. Right now, this comes sometimes directly. People will say this directly about God, but they'll also say it indirectly to God through God's people. They'll say, if you were really representing God, you would be happy with my life choices. That's not very Christian to be upset with my life choices because my God is a God who affirms whatever I decide to be. I just watched uh, this week a little video clip of a pastor, I'll put this in quotes, with a drag queen uh, at the altar of a church with two little girls talking about from Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 how God transforms our minds and that person uh, uh, interpreted that passage to say God wants us all to grow and what he's causing us to do by transforming our minds is to move us to a people who, who accept all people no matter what they do. Now, that's the in, most interesting take on Romans 12, 1 and 2 that I've ever heard, right? And by the time we get there, you're going to say, how on earth did he get there? Well, he got there by not reading the rest of the book, okay? So we live in that kind of moment where, matter of fact, uh, one of the definitions of love is that you should affirm me, right? Whatever I decide to do, your job, if you're a good friend or if you're a good citizen, is that you should just be happy and, matter of fact, celebrate whatever choices I make. So when we come here, we we already operate often with the sense that I'm the standard of what's good and right, and I get to tell that to God. As a matter of fact, I can dictate that to God or speak on his behalf, and whatever I decide is right is right. So this comes out sometimes, too, when you ask people who have religious sensibilities, right? It's still like uh, in America, it's like 80% of the people believe in God. Now, if we believe Paul... Paul says there's actually 100% of the people who believe in God because everyone that knows, everyone that exists knows that God exists. And those who deny his existence are people who are suppressing what they already know. So biblically speaking, 100% of the people know who God is. And wherever you go on the earth, you find people who worship some sort of deity or they create a deity which they worship because we're hardwired to worship. It's common. But when you ask people about how they're doing, how they and God are doing, you'll get answers like this. I may not be perfect, but I don't... And then you fill in the blank. Or this one, I go to church. Or I was baptized, or I was confirmed, right? I just want to say, just for record's sake, I think my wife meets all those criteria. I think she was baptized uh, as an infant, sprinkled, and then baptized as an adult. So she is as clean as you can get. Right, so she's been thoroughly washed. Matter of fact, if there's another kind of baptism you know of, she'll probably do that one too. So, 
right, whatever it is, right, baptized or confirmed, people say that. Uh, here's another one that applies to a lot of people. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a Christian home. I think I'm good with God. Right now, in many cultures, say, for example, Pastor Steve here in, in Egypt and different places, uh, your Christianity is often your social location, what family you were born into. Well, who are you? I'm a Christian. Why? Because I was born into a Christian home. Uh, here's another one. This is one I've heard in talking to people. Well, I try to be a good person. I'm sure God will be fine with me. You just try to be a good person. I'm sure God will be fine. Or this is one that I've heard on behalf of other people, right? If anybody is going to get into heaven, there's no doubt it will be. Have you heard that one? I've had that one. I remember sharing the gospel with someone and having the wife of the man I was sharing the gospel with uh, perform defense attorney roles. She was defending him, and I wasn't accusing him of anything, but her answer was, you don't know what a good man he is, and if there's anybody who's going to be okay with God, it's going to be him. Then, right, you've heard this within Christian circles or even from unbelievers talking about, non-followers of Christ talking about Christians. How could someone call themselves a Christian and do, right, you've heard that one. Or, right, we even have a term right now where everybody is busy signaling their virtue, right, virtue signaling, taking badges of honor. I'm green, I'm holier than you are because I, I want a sustainable world, right? I, 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 uh, I um, uh, recycle everything. I have sustainable foods. You know, I only eat cheese from happy cows, right? I only want chickens that have lived a good life so that their goodness flows into me, right? They're, they're free-range chickens. Uh, I want to make sure that the cows were loved, right? M, M, Emily, right? So Emily loves her cows, Right, I want to make sure, right, because I, I want sustainable and I want to use, I don't want to use plastic. I want, I want you know, uh, paper straws. And again, these are not a good or bad issues, but, but that, that sums if you have those things, then you're more virtuous than other people. And it's interesting how uh, that's very important for people to be more virtuous than other people. Why should we even care? Why do we even care about our own virtue is an issue, right? Or... I am inclusive. That's another one. I'm not exclusive. I'm inclusive. Or I fight injustice. Or I accept that my skin color or sexual orientation makes me an oppressor. Okay, so I accept that. And that makes me virtuous, right, in terms of that. So we, we live in this moment where people are constantly uh, struggling with their own idea of whether they're good or not or whether they're good enough in terms of that, but that, that just raises the question, how good is good enough? Right, how do you know if you're okay with God? How many things do you have to do? Now, this is why I want to I say for Paul, when we read this thing, we, we often think, well, this seems negative, and there's a, there's a pressure in our culture. I want to come to church and feel good about myself, right? Because I want a God who affirms me. Well, one of the things that happens, right, if you've ever been to the doctor, is you don't want a doctor who tells you things that are untrue about you. Right? You go to a doctor and they, they take an x-ray, they do a C, CT scan, they look at you and they say, oh, there's some cancer in your colon. And then you go to walk up to them and, and they're having this conversation behind, well, we don't want them to feel bad about how they're doing, so when they come in, just tell them they're good. Right? Well, that, that happened to my, my mom this, this last fall. Was, we were just recalling this where we were last fall, going in and out of the hospital uh, before she had some surgery. And thank God she's doing really well right now. But that was an alarming. Nobody likes to have the word cancer said to you. But we understand that a surgeon or a doctor, that the pain they inflict is to heal, not just to injure. And what we want to say here, Paul is not inflicting pain because he's some angry old guy. He's not slashing and burning. He's not even operating from a position of his own moral superiority. If you know anything about Paul, you see his testimony all the time and famously in 1 Corinthians 15, I am who I am by the what? By the grace of God, right? I, I did not attain anything. I did, I did not owe, uh, deserve anything from God. As a matter of fact, I just, I, I, I wonder at his mercy because I was running the hardest I could against his purposes. I was killing people who were following Jesus, I hated uh, uh, God and, and his ways, and God in his mercy rescued me. And so Paul regularly talks about himself as the chief of sinners. 
the chief of sinners. That's his title. You can read about it in 1 Timothy chapter 1. So when we're listening to Paul, I want to encourage you, this is the pain of a surgeon, the pain of somebody who wants to promote healing in souls that are darkened and broken by sin. So Paul knows that the real question, and this is Pastor Will's, the real question is, is how does God think you are doing? Not how you think you're doing, but how does God think you're doing? Right? That's the real question because he's the one that sets the standard. He knows that as sin is redefined, Paul knows that as we redefine sin and we soften it, we replace God's standards for our own standards, and then all of a sudden we don't need to be delivered from anything. We just need other people to recognize that I'm already good and that God's fine with me. And Paul is coming back in and saying, no, no, people are telling you the lie. This is the lie that started right in the whole biblical storyline in the Garden of Eden. Right, that I can be my own standard of what's good and right. Right, right at the core, right? What Adam and Eve, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Right, God wanted them to trust him to tell them who they were, about who he is, about the nature of their relationship with them, how they were to relate to one another, to let him be God and them be the human beings that he created. And instead, right, the evil one succeeded in, in, in tempting and deceiving Adam and Eve and they wanted to be like God. The, 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 the sad thing is they can't be because they're not God. And so in their skewed mind, they move God out of the picture and they start to become their own standard bearers. And so now they don't have the creator to tell them who they are, to tell them what's good, to tell them how they should relate to one another. And so they begin to create their own gods and their lives fall apart. And so as you read the biblical storyline after Genesis chapter 3, you can read about the fall, right? That what do you find immediately? You find discord between Adam and Eve, right? Where's the battle of the sexes? It starts in Genesis chapter 3. They start accusing each other, attacking one another. It introduces pain and toil and suffering as the world is fallen and full of disease. By the time you get to chapter 4, you've got brothers killing each other over envy. So the issue here is that Paul wants to get at the real issue. We need to know we're sinners. We need to know we need help and that we cannot provide it for ourselves. This is the key idea. We need help and we can't provide it. We need a surgeon who can deal with the evil within us and the impact of the evil on our very lives. So the good news of the gospel is, is that the darkness that's within you that makes you want to elevate yourself over God, that make you the standard that judges everybody else, the person that envies other people and wants to tear them down, the person who is out of control when it comes to your appetite sexually or with food, right? The person who is unbridled in your anger and you seethe with wrath against other people, who's going to deal with that cancer in your soul? Who's going to deal with that? And then ultimately, right? Dear Donna, many of you who don't know Donna here, Donna, just a beloved member of our church and her, her, her husband, John, just loved Jesus, served us. She was often the person who beautified our, our grounds by doing the flowers. And just a sweet, sweet Christian woman who's going to deliver you from your own appointment with death. Well, Donna, I'm confident that Christ has delivered her. And that's not the final word. We may go stand by a graveside, but that's not the last time. That's just a passing moment. One day, the Lord that has saved her from the darkness within her is going to save her from all the impact of the fall, and she's going to be new and fresh. Right? So that's the hope that we have. So the issue here is, who's going to deal with that? So now he goes right now, and this is where you're going to find Paul frequently. He's going after his own contemporaries. He's going after his own people. Okay, and this is, a, this is a love, any of us know who are followers of Jesus, the people closest to us are often the hardest people to deal with. Not because they're a problem, it's because we're a problem. Because when you go up to uncle so-and-so, or mom or dad, or sister or brother, you bring all of your life with you and they've lived with you. And you've sinned and you've done some stupid things, right? And sometimes you've been careless toward them and you've misrepresented Christ, and sometimes you, you were a hypocrite. You said things and then you didn't follow through. 
And so Paul's dealing with the people who know him. They know he was committed. They know he's he's turned his back on the Judaism that they believe. They know that he's walked away from the synagogue. They know these things that have happened to him. He's going back after them. If you want to see his attitude that lies behind chapter 2, you need to go read chapter 9, the very first part of the chapter. Paul says, I wish I could be accursed for the sake of my contemporaries. My heart is broken for them. So this is Paul's labor of love, his labor of love to tell them who they are. So Paul steps in to deliver the bad news they need to hear in order so that they'll be open to the good news. That's what he's trying to do, okay? Now, so let's walk through it. So what he wants to say, and you'll notice here a very important word just as we begin, you therefore, right? If you circle that little therefore, therefore is saying he's drawing something forward from the previous passage. Here's the accusation that he's making against his fellow Jews. They would read 118 uh, to the end of the chapter and say, well, that's not us. That's those pagan Gentiles. That's those people that are involved in polytheism and worshiping other gods and doing all this kind of crazy things involved in sexual debauchery. That's not us. That's not Jews. We don't do that. Paul is making this radical statement. My fellow Jews also are people who recognize the truth about God, reject it, replace it, and rejoice in suppressing it as much as the Gentiles do. That's a radical statement, but they would be completely offended at that moment. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And so he says here, he begins with this statement, therefore, you have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. Now, he doesn't explicitly mention the Jews here, but it's very clear that he's working his way to an explicit mention as he gets started because he's going to condemn them for doing the very things that they judge other people for. When you get down to chapter 2, verse 17, he's going to bring up some of the specific examples of what they do. Matter of fact, this is the characteristic of the Jews and their high moral ground. We're going to see it again in chapter 14, where the Jews are judging the Gentiles, the Gentile Christian brothers, because they're not observing Jewish customs and feasts. And so Paul's going right after his own countrymen, right after his own ethnic group. He's speaking, right? This is the apostle to the Gentiles, a Jew, who's now speaking to his fellow Jews. So he wants to say that we all belong in there. Now, here's where we begin, okay? And I I found this the other day. He's saying this to his Jewish contemporaries. Don't judge someone just because they sin differently than you do. All right? Don't judge someone just because they, ju- they sin differently than you do. And this is what he's saying to them. Okay, I, I don't care about the particular categories. I'm just talking about whether you're a sinner or not. Okay, just, so, just because you can stand at one moment and say, I don't do that, and I don't do that, right? You remember the famous scene of Jesus, right, seeing the Pharisees and say, oh, oh I don't do these things, and I don't do these things. And, and then contrast it with the publican who's sitting down there going, God, Be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, who do you think was justified before God? Right, so the issue here, this is what he's poking at them. Don't judge someone just because they sin differently than you do, is what he's after. All right, now, here's where we begin. So let's read uh, down through verse 6. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you pass judgment, do the same things. Now, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, a human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think that you will escape God's judgment? Right? Now, first, I just put it here, is that Paul is going to take this next section all the way down to uh, the end of chapter 2, and he's going to marshal his evidence for why it is that Jews are sinners like the Gentiles. That's what he's trying to do. And he's going to take a very detailed attempt to go after it. And the very first thing that he says in these first three uh, uh, verses, they disobey what God demands and wrongly think they're off the hook. They've got their own standards. They see themselves over other people. They don't sin like those Gentiles do. We're not involved in heathen worship of idols. We're not involved in sexual debauchery. Haven't you read the Old Testament law? We don't behave that way. Right? Haven't you read what God revealed to us in Scripture? We don't behave that way. And so they're standing what they think is high moral ground from which they're looking at the Gentiles and saying, well, we're not like that. And Paul just comes straight back and say, no, the things that you're judging them for, you commit. 
which had been tremendously offensive, right? Then look at chapter, uh, verse 4. He says, Or do you not show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. Okay. Now, the issue here is their hardened hearts, right? Their sense of self-righteousness, their sense that I'm okay with God, right? We're not like those people, right? We're not like those people. That's terrible, right? And it's really their hearts are hardened to their own sin, and they, make, they mistake God's restraint for his approval. And they reject repentance, and they're rousing God's anger. Right now, we, we've, we've all done this where we have, we have um, abused the kindness that we've received from other people. I mean, this is going to happen at a job where your, your boss trusts you. And they don't watch over you closely. And, and it's real easy to, you know, eat something from the store or take a little bit of money or uh, to take privileges or to spend time on your phone and get paid for surfing, you know, TikTok. It's real easy to do those kind of things. And, and instead of taking their kindness as an inducement as it should be to perform well at work, we use it as an excuse or a, a, an idea that we can get away with things. And the same thing here is that, you know, I remember as a kid, right, my, what was one of the things that my mom and dad would always say, Greg, you know, we may not catch you what, but your sin will, okay, so you guys all had parents like mine, right? Your sin's going to find you out. God may not be able to see it, but I mean, I may, you, I may not be able to see it, but God sees it, right? I was convinced that my mom was omniscient when I was young. Right, because she knew everything it seemed like that I was doing. She would tell me it. it was because she had a whole network of other moms who would report on me around the neighborhood. Before I got home, she knew what had happened. She said, Greg, what happened over to Rollins? Rollins, why? Nothing. We were playing over to Rollins. Greg, what, what about that wall that fell down over to Rollins? <clears throat> uh, yeah, that did happen, Mom. Well, how'd that happen? Right? And she had to wean around, and of course she was wanting me to tell the truth right off. She had to, she had to you know, drill it out of me, right? Because I was trying to protect myself. And I thought, how did, in the world did she know? Well, it's because Mrs. Moran called her, right? And as she was spanking her own boys, right? So that kind of thing, right, is there. So the, the kindness of God, I remember, right, thinking, because people would tell me I would do something, and I just kind of hunker down inside and think, uh oh, what's God going to do? Well, well, nothing immediately happened, right? Nothing immediately happened, right? And it's like, okay, maybe, maybe God didn't see it. Maybe he doesn't care. And Paul wants to say, no, that's God's kindness, right? What's one of my favorite verses in the Psalms? Thank God that he does not treat us in the way our sins deserve, right? So they're taking, they're taking God's patience with them, and they're mistaking it for approval, and my kindness should be leading you to repent of your sin. And instead, you're thinking that you're okay with me and continuing in your sin simply because I'm not immediately punishing you for it. Now, number three, verses seven through 10. <clears throat> Here's where he goes. He says, to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are seek, self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Now what Paul is saying here simply is they have arrogantly forgotten that God is the judge, not them. He's the standard keeper. By virtue of being their creator, he has created them. He has rights of ownership over them by virtue of them being his creation. He has determined, right, this is Paul's, he's determined the very nature of our being. He's bounded our human potential. And, and he's calling us to live into it as he's designed us to live, right? And so the standard that stands over us is God's standard. I'm not self-created. I don't get to determine who I am. And so 
They have arrogantly forgotten that God is the judge, not them, and no one sets the standards for guilt or innocence. God alone is judge. Okay? He's alone judge. And for, for God, we're going to come here, the standard is just in one word, it's impossible for us to meet. Because did you notice that the standard here, it's not just that you do the right thing from time to time. Okay, notice what he says, uh, verse 7. To those who by persistence in doing good, they constantly do it. They always do it. They always live to the glory and honor of God. Now, I don't care who you are. I don't care what family you grew up in. I don't care how good your reputation is to the people who know you, right? If we were all spiritual detectives, so I'm, I'm looking at Andy Brads. Andy Brads is a great guy, right? I don't know any bad things about Andy at all, right? But if I had God's view on Andy's soul and heart, right, and I followed him around, and I was a spiritual detective, meaning I could watch what he does on the outside, but I could also pay attention to the dispositions and attitudes of his heart. Andy, he's pretty self-controlled. He may not break out while he's teaching his junior hires or high schoolers. High schoolers. While he's teaching high schoolers, I, I have never known Andy, right, to throw some of the high schoolers down and just pound the snot out of them, right? I've never, I've never heard that. That doesn't mean that Andy hadn't had to control himself sometime because he wanted to pound the snot out of them. Or that he just got discouraged. Or that he got wounded in his pride. Or that, that some kid said something that made him go in and his insecurities came to play and then he behaved out of those insecurities and his pride and weakness. All, all those kind of things that happen, right? In terms of that, and so the standard is impossible. The other side of the standard, right? There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. Well, that's everybody. Now, he, what he's telling them, I don't care how moral you are, even your own standard, you can't keep it. Right, this is the thing here. It, it, okay, let's just start with your own, own standard, right? You think you should be honest. You think you should be a person who doesn't reduce people to objects that you use, that you should be a loving person and so forth and so on. Well, you can't even keep your own standard. If you're honest with yourself, you get angry. If you're honest with yourself, you're full of yourself and you want to be elevated. You want other people to elevate you and you get angry when they don't elevate you and you don't get your way. You envy other people. You wish them ill because their successes make you feel bad about your life. Right? Those are all the kinds of things we do them in ways as we get older, we get more sophisticated. Right? We do it within our soul. We don't often show it outside unless you're somebody who's on social media and then you lose your mind. And you say all kinds of things you would never say to a person face to face. Right? Now, what's he going to say in verses 11 to 16? Look here with me. Here's more of his evidence. For God does not show favoritism, right? This is one of those things here that nobody has an in with God. Your, 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 your um, good deeds that you've done, your seeking for social justice, the fact that you're so green, right, that your, your skin is green, right? The fact that, that you're doing all these things, well, I, if somebody's going to get into heaven, it's got to be me because I've got a leg up on God because look at what kind of good person I am. Well, Paul is just, uh, Paul, God doesn't have partiality. He doesn't respect, it's kind of a, a, a word that has to do, he doesn't respect one face over another. And so here's what he says. For God does not show favoritism. All who sin apart from the law will perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law, for it's not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Okay. Now, what Paul's talking about here is they were forgotten. No one gets special treatment, and he's making it clear that Jews and Gentiles, those who have the law, meaning who have been gifted with the revelation of God's will, the Jews, and those who don't have the law, Gentiles, right? they're going to be accountable for the truth that God's revealed to them. As the Jews are, are extra accountable because of the clarity and the depth that they've had revealed to them. Now, verses 14 and 15, one of the most difficult verses in this passage, are about justifying how the Gentiles are a law to themselves. How is it that somebody who doesn't have the scriptures actually knows what God requires and can do it to a degree? Okay? Now, this is the most technical thing I'm going to give you this morning here. Right? So this is not in your notes here. So this would be one, if you want to follow it up later, take your phone out and take a picture of it. Right? It'll be up on the website later. 
Now, there's three things that he's going to say to Gentiles, right? This is to every human being that exists for Paul. The law that non-Jews know is made up of what is revealed in creation, right? You remember? Turn back to chapter 1. Chapter 1, look at verse 18. This is referred to, when theologians speak about it, as general revelation, meaning that which all people know that God has declared about himself. <clears throat> so verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, right? And this is Pastor Will's talking about this. It, it's not that they don't know or can't know, it's that they won't know. It's an act of the will. It's suppressing what's already there. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, why? Because the God who created them has made it plain. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so the people are without excuse. So every person in the world has a knowledge of God, of his power, of his greatness, right? That's in creation. And so this is one C.S. Lewis is famous for, and not him, but many other people like it. Wherever you go, wherever you go, you find a God consciousness among human beings. They worship. They're built to worship. They do worship. They want something, a connection with the transcendent. They may have different conceptions of who that God is, but finding a God in cultures is not hard. It's in the West where we're trying to suppress that as best we can, right? So the second thing is, come to the end of chapter 1, come down to verse 32. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them, right? The other aspect of this, we call this in the idea, human beings are created in the image of God. And what Paul's saying is there's, there's an inbuilt moral code that people have. This is why we're not surprised as followers of Jesus when you find unbelievers who love their spouses. You find unbelievers who believe that murder is wrong. You find unbelievers who, who, who think that, right, you, you need to be loyal to the people in your life and you need to sacrifice your life for them. Well, there's an inbuilt design plan in human beings, they will suppress it to some degree or the other, but it's there. It's a witness to the fact that they're made to do things. They have an oughtness about them, right? If you ever notice about human beings, we just can't be, right? There was a famous commercial that I think Calvin Klein came out with, and it had these various people and various different uh, sexualities and dresses and ages and so forth and so on. And they were selling a perfume, which I always think is interesting, selling a perfume over the TV, right, or over media, because there's no scratch and sniff pad. I mean, you don't know what it smells like. Uh, but, and, and the title of the perfume was B. B-E. Just B. Well, none of us can just be. We think, should I be that? Ought I be that? Right? Should I be that? Because we have an oughtness about us in terms of that. And then this is where the conscience comes in. Now come to 2, 14 and 15. He said, Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature the things required by the law, by nature it's in building them, they are law for themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their conscience is also bearing witness. Now so here's the third part of it. So they have knowledge of what's built into creation. They have the ability to understand what God has revealed himself in creation. They have an inbuilt moral code so that they make judgments on people and they themselves even sin in the face of the fact that they know it's wrong. Then thirdly is they've got a conscience, right? For Paul, the conscience is a morally neutral mechanism. This is what my, my a diagram is about. Your conscience is the hard wiring. It's like the, the, um, uh, the software that's built into you as a human being. And you're just made to act on principle. You're made to evaluate your choices over against your beliefs and values. So the beliefs and values that God has made available to them in creation, has built into them, 
when you do something, your conscience checks whether what you did agrees with what you believe. And when they disagree, it goes guilty. It makes you feel uneasy, right? But the conscience is only as valid in its judgments as are the beliefs and values that inform it. So what are, you, what are busy, those who are rejecting God, they're busy, and this is the whole process of Romans chapter 1. Although they know God, right, they didn't glorify him as God, but they suppressed what was known about him and exchanged the truth for a lie. So they're busy replacing what God's put in there. They're fighting against their own inbuilt design and they're replacing it with alien norms of their own making so that their conscience will stop bothering them. This is why you find people at the end of chapter one who are sinning with a clear conscience. They're consistent with their false beliefs, the lie, as Paul would say it, and they're trying to conform their life to that lie. Okay, so those three things Paul wants to say, and so they have a law, the Jews obviously have a law, and so that's Paul's point, okay? Now, wow, I'm moving, I'm getting there, I may get done. Okay, let's look at at chapter 17 to 24, right? He's continuing with his evidence, right? We're still building it. What are some specific examples, Paul, right? If you can hear, Paul often will bring up the, the people that he thinks he's having a dialogue with, right? He envisions, he'll sometimes let them ask the question, he's going to do that in chapter three. But, well, wait a minute, Paul, you, you're speaking in principle right now. You, you give me some examples. Well, here he goes, verse 17. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, If you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth, right? Well, that's a pretty high, right? Sounds like a pretty, uh, you know, we're not like them. You know, they need to look to us for guidance. Here's what he says, 21. You then, who teach your others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? And of course, these are all rhetorical questions. You could rephrase them as statements. You who preach against stealing, steal. Okay? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? And here he's talking about uh, inappropriate engagement with uh, with, uh, cult uh, and idolatry. 23, you who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? And then he backs it up with something that's been true of his people from time immemorial. He quotes here from Scripture, here in uh, verse 24 from Isaiah 52, as it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Well, this has been the case among the Jews since time immemorial. God created them to be the venue through which his character and his wonder would be displayed to the world. They were to be the light to the Gentiles. They were to be the people to declare God's character and and to open a way for the Gentiles to come into the blessing, right, of creation. And instead of becoming a light to the Gentiles, they were sucked into the darkness of the Gentiles. They became like them and compromised God's glory. So he says they're here, uh, no. Here's some examples, and here's the consequences. God's name was dishonored by you, right? When you were growing up in your home, one of the things that your parents were always trying to do, okay, hopefully they were loving you, right, and trying to get you to do the right thing. But sometimes when you were a good kid, like David, he was always a good kid. David Knight Kirk, our worship ministry, he was always a good kid. Uh, when, When David was obeying his mom, he would bear witness to his mom's standards, to his mom's character, because little David was nice, and he was kind, and he was respectful, and he obeyed the authorities in his life, and he cleaned up his room, and he was just the, the, the ideal child, right, David? Right? That's what Ali says, too, right? ideal husband, right? But you, you bear witness, but many times, David bore witness to his mom's standards when she was spanking him, 
Because she was saying, that's not consistent with my character. I love you too much, David, to get away from that. If you persist in that kind of behavior, it's going to ruin your life, ruin the people in your life. And your mom said, that's not good. Right? And so what's happening here is the consequences, they've misrepresented God. And God bore witness to his character, not positively through his people, but through his judgment of their misbehavior. Okay? Now, the last one then. Jews wrongly assume that their heritage and outward religious ritual will exempt them from condemnation. Here Paul speaks about circumcision. He speaks about uh, their uh, Jewish ritual in verse 25. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code and circumcision are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew, one who's rightly related to God, who is one merely outwardly, right? So, so we say to us who are non-Jews, it's not somebody who just goes to church. It's not somebody who just gets baptized. It's not somebody who dresses rightly when they come to church on Sunday morning. It's not the person who just uses the right phraseology all the time. It's not the person that, that ties or makes sure that they give a little back, back to the church or for the ministry or whatever the case may be. That's not what makes a person a Christian. He says here, it says, uh, it's not those outwardly, nor is circumcision merely physical or outward. No, a person is a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a circumcision of the heart by the Spirit. Circumcision was a sign that they were in the covenant under God's grace. Well, circumcision is the heart as I have accepted my fallenness. I've accepted my sinfulness. God, I ask for your mercy, and I get a new heart. That's the sign, a new me. That changes my outward behavior. Not by a written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Okay, now, here, I object. Paul's going to have some objections. Now, I'm going to go through these quickly because Paul's going to dedicate large sections of the book to answering all these objections. He introduces them and he swats them away, but he's going to come back and give an extended defense. So notice in verses 1 and 2. What advantage then, Paul, is there to being a Jew? And of what value is there in circumcision, right? Well, like, Paul, you've made it that the Jews don't have any advantage. You go to chapter 9, read all the advantages. Chapter 9, the very first part. The preeminent advantage is through them came the Messiah. Paul, is it really? And, this, and he once said, no, 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 it's wrong. Much in every way, first of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. Right? So you've had more truth, you've had more revealed about God than anyone. That's a great advantage. The sad thing is that you've taken more truth and you've rejected it in the face of deeper and greater knowledge. It heightens their guilt. Right? It's one thing to have somebody do something that they shouldn't do, right? So in Pastor Van's family, his boys, they, they were rugged, some difficult boys, like Jared, one of them there, some difficult boys. It's different if, if uh, Jesse does something and he didn't know it was wrong, that it was against the rules, it's a little bit different if he had walked up to Jared and said, Jared, don't do this. And then two minutes later, Jared does it. That's just different. That's what he's talking about with the Jews. Then the second one, if they are sinners like everyone else, doesn't that mean that God has been unfaithful to his promises? Look at verse 3. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar, as is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge, right? Now, this one, he's going to take three chapters to answer this question, chapters 9, 10, and 11, okay? It's a big one, okay? And he's going to say, no, God has been faithful to his promises to the patriarchs. So don't, don't come back at me and say that this gospel undermines God's faithfulness. Then the final one, here he comes. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, right? This is the kid, right? You know, I know I disobeyed you, Mom, at, at, the, at the grocery store. And I know I, I pulled that big display down and things went everywhere. And, and you know, things broke and things like that. But, but, Mom, you were able to display your righteousness when you disciplined me. At least I ought to get some credit. Right? I mean, come on, Mom. 
But it's, it, it, you know, in a much darker way, it's like Judas trying to come to heaven and saying, you know, hey, I got Jesus to the cross anyway. So he comes and says here, certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that God may result, that good may result. Their condemnation is just. Now, all three of these, and when we get to chapter 6, 7, and 8, he's going to deal with the famous question, if when I sin, grace abounds, Maybe I should sin a lot. Right? Sounds like uh, something that some child has probably thought of at one time. Okay? Now, so let me draw lessons, right? Our time is coming up. So let me draw lessons. Can I, can I just get just a recognition I made that all the way through? And, I, and I, hope, I hope that that was understandable at the same time, right, in terms of that. But let me, here's some, here's some big points to take away, right, from this. This is the fundamental thing. God the creator is good and determines what is good. Okay, now this is, the, this is the whole biblical wager. As the creator of all things, right, when he finished creating, what did he say? This is very good. Well, what did that mean in that sense? Well, it conformed to my exact created intentions. It reflects my purposes for my creation. There was some other standard of good that stood outside of God that he said, does this correspond to goodness? No, he is the standard of goodness. So God is good in terms of all of creation knows him and is accountable to him for what they know. Right? So this is the premise all the way through. All creation knows. For Paul, right now I know this is, this is a contentious statement, but for Paul there is no genuine atheist. And what I mean by genuine atheist, someone who cannot know that God exists. There are people who reject what they do know, but there are no true agnostics or atheists. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. And more than that, it's just not that we know, but we're accountable to him for what we know. Then thirdly, God is judge and will finally judge everyone. Right? This, is a, this is a strong statement. Right? I can think about, well, all I'm worried about is, is, is pleasing my boss or getting through this week or, 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 or my wife being happy with me and not coming down on me for something or making sure my parents aren't unhappy with me or whatever the case may be. Right? College students, you know, when that grade report comes and they actually ask me what it is, I, you know, I don't want to be ashamed before them. Right? Whatever the case may be, those are all simple ways that we're wired to please, but we're ultimately, we're ultimately wired for well done. And we ultimately fear, depart from me. Okay? God's standard is perfectly done truth. That's his standard. And, and it raises the idea, well, I can't. I mean, honestly, you can't. Right? I don't, if you're honest with yourself about every day, every day you've got broken pieces lying around. Every day, if you're honest with yourself, you've got grounds to say, God, I, I, I went my own way. I dealt with this in a way that that you didn't call me to. I struck out at this person. I did it in my heart even though they didn't know it. God, you were, 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 uh, I I fell into temptation today. I went places on the computer I shouldn't have gone. I wasted the opportunities you've given me. I went too far in my relationship with my girlfriend. I did all these kind of things. That's just what happens every day. And if you're not honest with yourself about that, you just don't have a good self-assessment. Every day. God sets the terms of salvation and the only one who can save. Paul's point for our, he's going to say later on, God shuts all up to disobedience. Why? So they will cry out for mercy. Because they can't earn it. Now, any of you recognize that song? Just as I am without one plea, right? David, will you come up? This is my last slide here. I want David to lead us in the last song here before we read a little scripture here. This is one of my favorite uh, moments from C.S. Lewis. This is, this, after you get done with this passage, this is a famous 
conference that C.S. Lewis was at, and they were all debating. It was a history of religions conference, and they were, it was a comparative religions conference, I'm sorry. Comparative, they're comparing religions to each other. And, and, of course, one of the things that's always the discussion is what makes Christianity different from every other religion, right? Because the, the kind of wisdom at this point in time in the 60s is that all religions are, are just different paths to the same goal. They're all just versions of the same thing. And, and it's famous because C.S. Lewis walks in at the end of the discussion, and he hears the discussion they're having, and so they pop the discussion to him, and they say, well, C.S. Lewis, what's the difference between Christianity and every other religion? And his answer is, right, oh, that's easy. It's grace. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, grace is, right, we have this phrase, and it fits pretty well. It's God's unmerited, unconditional favor right and in Christianity that separates itself from every other religion there is nothing you can do to earn God's favor there's no way you can reach that standard there's none righteous no not one and so at the core of it is embracing the fact that you're impotent, that you're helpless, that you're completely dependent, and you cast yourself on God's mercy. It's his grace that saves you. You don't merit it. You don't earn it, right? You can't coerce it from God. He doesn't look at you and say, I want you on my team. He says, you, you run away from me as hard as you can, and I'm going to give my mercy to you. I'm going to give you what you don't deserve because of what my son did. That's the difference. And for all of us who know Jesus, that's still true about your life. You need Jesus for everything. You can't make it on your own. You can't walk without listening to him every day and talking with him, walking around his people. You can't make it on your own. You've been made new with new appetites and new direction. Now you need to just drink it up. And the moment you think you can walk away or that you've got it settled, you're arrogant and you're, you're vulnerable. Right? So this is... This is the gospel. This is the good news.